Okay, so today we're going to talk about vision, and when we start with vision, we need to start with light, because vision is the perception of light, right? So what is light? I mean, yes, it's stuff that we see, but who can be more precise? You've taken a class in physics, what is light? It is a type of energy. What type of energy is it? Yeah, it's electromagnetic uh, radiation. And it's a particular type of electromagnetic radiation. It's the type that we can see. So there are other types of electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation that we can see. Like infrared. Do you guys know what infrared light is? So like in the spy cameras, like it's really dark outside, but they can still see what's going on because they're using infrared uh, electromagnetic radiation. Normally we're not um, sensitive to this, but we can be with uh, technology. Light, it varies in amplitude and in wavelength. So what's amplitude? Those of you who are in the front row, sus, I want to see the ones farther back know what it is. It's related to brightness, but, but what is it? Like, so here we have this thing. We have this wave. And what represents the amplitude on that? Those of you who can see it and read it, don't say it. So is amplitude related to the height or the width there? Yeah, amplitude is related to the height. Amplitude is basically the height of the wave. How about wavelength? Wavelength is the distance from one point in the wave to the same point one cycle away. So you can measure it between the, the peaks or the valleys or the midpoints, and you get the same answer. So we have height, I'm sorry, amplitude, which is height, and wavelength, which is the distance between two of the same points in that electromagnetic radiation. Sometimes people, in addition to talking about wavelength, they talk about something else that starts with an F. You guys know what this is? Frequency, that's exactly right. What's the relationship between wavelength and frequency? When wavelength is longer, that's less frequency. Yeah, the higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency. So there's a negative correlation. In fact, there's a perfect negative correlation when we're talking about wavelength and frequency. So things with a really long wave have a low frequency. Things with a short wave have a high frequency. All right, so transduction, what is this? When I say that something transduces something else, what does that mean? Transformation. It transforms something, yeah. So transduction has to do with transformation. When we're talking about vision, what type of transformation are we talking about? Energy. Right, so we have energy, the light energy, which is electromagnetic radiation, but our brain doesn't work on electromagnetic energy. What does our brain work on? It, it works on these neural signals, which are chemically based. There are these electrochemical signals. So transduction is transforming one form of energy into something else. If you guys had physics, and remember, there's this law of conservation, right? Which says that you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy, but you can change it. So transduction is all about changing the energy. So we've got our electromagnetic radiation, and since the brain can't use this, we need to change this electromagnetic radiation into an electrochemical signal. You'll learn a bit more about this if you take biological psychology. If you're a psych major, all of you will take that. Uh, you can learn a lot more about this if you want to take sensation and perception, which is one of my favorite courses. So I would encourage you to take it, but you don't have to. Okay, so we can talk about the physical stimulus, right? There's electromagnetic radiation, we can talk about the different wavelengths or frequencies, and we can also talk about the amplitude. But when people talk about colors, they don't say like, oh, look at that, that's a pretty low wavelength uh, color right there. They say like, oh, that's a, a pretty green or, you know, a bright orange, a bright red. So when we're talking about psychological properties of color, we refer to hue, brightness, and saturation. So what is hue? What does hue correspond to? Physical dimension of the wave. The physical dimension of the wave. Which physical dimension? The amplitude or the wavelength? 
Yeah, q is related to the wavelength or the relative proportions of wavelengths that are available. Uh, and we'll talk about this in more detail in just a little bit. How about brightness? Brightness refers to how intense the stimulus is, okay, and what physical property of the wave is related to the intensity. Amplitude. Yeah, it's amplitude. So with brightness, we're talking about amplitude. Things with the higher amplitude are brighter. Things with the lower amplitude are less bright. They're dimmer. And how about saturation? What does it mean to have, like, you know, a saturated red as opposed to a desaturated red? If you guys use Photoshop or programs like Photoshop, you can increase the saturation, right? And what does it do? It makes colors look sort of deeper and richer, right? What's happening when we make the color deeper or richer? Purity. Yeah, saturation is all about the purity of the color. How pure the color is it? And this is based on the amount of wavelengths than those that are creating the color that you see that are present. So if we look at this cone, someone want to turn off the... Yeah, that's better. If we look at the cone, we are varying the color on all these three dimensions. As we go around the outside of the circle, we're changing the hue. As we go from the bottom of the cone to the top of the cone, what we're doing is changing the brightness. So here on this line, we have the same hue color, but here we have a, a dim version of it, and here we have a bright version of it. Now, as we go into the center of the cone, we are decreasing the saturation, which means that we're adding basically all of the other wavelengths besides those that correspond to the hue that we're seeing. And what happens as we're adding these wavelengths is things become white. If you guys remember Newton, he did these experiments. Right? Before he did these experiments, people thought that there were different types of light. That there was blue light and green light <coughs> and white light, and that white light was something different from blue light or red light. But what is white light? Yeah, white light is just all of the different wavelengths put together, right, in the same intensities. So if we have all of the colors, all of the wavelengths being put together at the same intensity, we'll see something that appears white, right? <coughs> so here, outside, around the edges, we're seeing a hue with very few other wavelengths, except for that, the wavelength that's representing the hue by itself. Does that make sense? And as we get closer to the middle, we're adding more of all of the other colors. And this doesn't change how bright it is. It, changed how, it changes how deep the color is. Right? So here we have a purple that's like a really deep purple. And here it's just sort of a, a, a not a bright purple. Right? This is a bright, oh, I'm sorry. Here, this is a bright blue. That's a dark blue but we have a, a less intense purple. Does that make sense? So that's how the psychological corresponds to the physical. What's an illusion? Misleading. An illusion is something that's misleading. Okay, good. Can someone give me more? Misleading about what? doesn't have to be an image. It's something that misleads you about what you see, which is related to images, but a more broad definition of illusion. You don't have to have just visual illusions. You can have auditory illusions or even touch illusions. It's your senses misleading you about the truth. Pardon? Uh, not necessarily subjective. So there are some culturally based illusions, but there are other things that are that are less subjective that people generally will agree on. Um, <clears throat> anyway, if we think back to Plato's cave, remember we talked about the people and they only see the shadows, and that these shadows are just an illusion, right? It's just some blocked light that they're seeing. 
And this actually isn't what's really out there. It's an illusion of what's really out there. So with an illusion, we have a misperception. We see some stimulus, but we make judgments about it that are actually inconsistent with the way that the stimulus actually is. So remember earlier I said that we don't see like something like, oh, that's a pretty short wavelength color. We say, oh, that's a nice blue, right? So we don't see longer or shorter waves. We don't see more or less frequent waves. We don't see, you know, taller or smaller waves. We see you, uh, brightness, thank you, and saturation. But we see warmth. People talk about warm colors, right? So see Bella, she's wearing a red shirt. Is that a warm color or a dark color? Yeah, it's a warm color. So people think like the reds are warm and the blues are cool, right? So this isn't a huge problem because the warmth correlates with the wavelength. The warmer colors are longer wavelength hues. The cooler colors are often uh, shorter wavelength hues. But this correlation isn't perfect. So some things like violet, violet appears warmer than blue. How can this be? Violet is actually a shorter wavelength than blue is. So it should look cooler if this is really perfectly correlated, but it's not. And also blue, if you think about how close blue looks to red as opposed to how blue looks compared to orange, which look closer? Is blue closer to red or closer to orange? Yeah, most people think that it looks closer to red. Right? But in actuality, if you look at the wavelength, the wavelengths of an orange stimulus are closer to the wavelengths of the blue stimulus than those of the red, which means that we're actually misperceiving the world. Does that make sense? Thus, this perception of color is actually an illusion. We're perceiving things that aren't there in the real um, stimulus. Here's another one. So we can mix lights that look red and green, and we get yellow. You guys know what uh, pixels people use in computer monitors and in this projector? What color pixels are there? There's blue, green, and not white, but red. Yeah, they use a white light, but then they shine it through red, blue, and green filters, right? So, this yellow here, there's not actually a wavelength there that corresponds to yellow. We have wavelengths that correspond to red, green, and blue. Does that make sense? But yet we perceive this as yellow. So how could this possibly happen? How can we see a color that's not actually there? Make it. Mix it. Mix two colors and you get it. So we can mix two colors, right? We take some red, we take some blue, and we get purple if we're mixing paints. But how does this mixing work? I mean, there has to be something biological that allows us to perceive these, these mixed things as something different, right? When we mix red and blue, we see purple. We don't see like, oh, that's a reddish-bluish thing, right? Like, oh, there are little bits of red and there are little bits of blue. No, it's purple, right? have certain induction mechanisms of Actually, we do see red and green from the particles, but we induce it to another color, like a mental representation. So, maybe, so if you guys are familiar with art, there's this technique called pointillism, and they take the individual different colors, and when you sort of scan back, the colors sort of blend together. So it's possible that we're seeing individual colors, but when I look at this, like, I don't see, oh yes, that's some uh, green and that's some blue. I don't see that. Instead I see, it's yellow, right? I'm sorry, red and green. <clears throat> so Young and Helmholtz came up with this theory about how this could happen. It's called trichromatic theory. What's trichromatic theory? The name sort of gives it away. Tri means three. three. And chrome, or chroma, means color. 
That's right. So this is a three-color theory. So what does it say, the three-color theory? The main colors are green, this red, green, and blue. So it's, it's not that the main colors are red, green, and blue, but it's something else. It's something about our eyes. Three types of color receptors. That's right. We have three types of color receptors, right? So we have three different types of color receptors, short, medium, and long. This is actually simplification. There are more types, but primarily there are the short color receptors, or the short wavelength receptors, the medium wavelength receptors, and the longer wavelength receptors. Each of these respond best to a particular wavelength. This means that medium receptors are going to respond best to medium wavelength uh, electromagnetic radiation. They might also, in fact, not might, but they do also respond a little bit to shorter wavelengths and to longer wavelengths, but they respond best to medium wavelengths. Does that make sense? The idea is that the hue that we actually see isn't based on just the response of one of these, but it's based on the pattern of responses over all of them. So we can look at the relative rates of responding for the three different types of receptors. So here we're going to look at the receptor's responses to different hues. So if I present a red stimulus, something with a long wavelength, the long wavelength receptors respond a lot. The medium wavelength receptors respond a little, some, not as much as the long, but still a little, and the short wavelength receptors respond the least. Does that make sense? Now if we go to a little bit shorter wavelength, like orange, it's interesting, the long wavelength receptors actually respond better to orange than they do to red. But look, we see differences in the other ones too. The medium wavelength receptors respond much better, and the short, there's really no change. If we go shorter wavelength still and look at something green, now the long is responding less again. We have a huge response from the medium wavelength receptors and a larger response from the short. Finally, when we go much shorter, and we see a huge response from the short and smaller responses from the other two. So what this is trying to show you is that how these receptors respond depends on the type of light that's out there. For lights that are close in frequency to their favorite frequency, they respond a ton. For lights that are farther away from that frequency, they respond less and less, 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 less. Does that make sense? Now, the overall pattern of this reveals the hue. So if we just look at a single receptor, we can't tell what the hue is. We become confused. So let's take a look at the short receptor. Imagine that we have a tiny, tiny little response. Well, well look, is it a red or an orange? I have no idea. You know, it's responding the same way to both of those, so I can't tell those two hues apart if I'm only using my short wavelength receptor. It could be something else, too. Maybe we have a really dim, that is, a not bright blue stimulus. So here, each of these are roughly equally bright, right? So at equal levels of brightness, you get a much greater response for the short receptor here than you do for these. But what if you had a really, really bright red and a really, really dim blue? the pattern of responding for just the short might be the same. Does that make sense? This is sort of a tricky concept, so I want to make sure I'm not losing anybody. Questions? Yeah, if we're looking at the medium ones, we can't tell the difference between a bright red, so here's a bright red, so we have sort of a moderate response. <coughs> Or dark green, right? If the green is dark, we're not going to have as large of a response. So just by looking at a single receptor, we can't tell what the hue is. It's only by looking at the overall pattern.
Uh, this is actually really fantastic. If we didn't have this ability to combine the relative responses of these different receptors, we wouldn't be able to have things like color television screens. By color television screens, we use three colors of pixels, red, green, and blue. And what we can do is we can increase or decrease the amounts of red that there is, and the green that there is, and the blue that there is, to artificially create something with a pattern like this. Right? So we can give a, a lot, a really bright red, and a really bright green, so we get a, a good long response, but a greater green than a red to get this medium response, and then a tiny bit of blue. And we get orange. <clears throat> if we didn't have this ability to take these three colors, we would need millions of different colored pixels. So when computers were first coming out, they were just like one color screens. But then they added like, ooh, it's two colors. And then they added three colors. And then they stopped at three colors. But they changed how much of each color could be present. Right? So right now, most monitors, they work on 256 different levels. So 256 is a really strong red, blue, or green. And a zero is a very weak red, blue, or green, or no red, blue, or green. And by combining the different amounts of red, blue, and green, the computers, when they advertise them, they say that this monitor shows millions of colors, right? Millions of colors. It, it's a lie. It's only showing three colors. So your perception of the colors on your screen is an illusion. So you are perceiving millions of colors, but it's actually only showing three. Thanks to try for meta theory, we understand how this works. Awesome. This also creates some interesting situations where we can perceive colors that don't actually exist in the light spectrum. So when people draw uh, rainbows, the, the colors of the rainbow are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But we have some colors that people use that aren't in there, like magenta. This is magenta. There's no magenta in the rainbow. There's no wavelength that corresponds to magenta. There's no purple in the rainbow. There's violet in the rainbow, but violet is not purple. But yet people use purple, so this is really cool. We are using colors that actually don't exist as a single wavelength. It's an illusion. So if you use purple when you draw a rainbow, you're wrong. So I'm a really mean dad. Like my kids, they come home and they show me their artwork. They're like, Dad, look at my pretty rainbow. And I'm like, dude, you use <laughs> purple. It's violet. OK, so in order to do this transduction and to process this information about uh, amplitude and wavelength and perceive hue, brightness, and uh, saturation, we need to get the light back to the receptors. Right, so here's a cute cat out in the, the world, and the light from this cat travels. What does it hit first on the eye? Cornea. It first hits the cornea. And what does the cornea do? It's sort of rounded in shape. What do round things do when light hits them? It refracts the light. In less technical terms, what does it mean when you refract light? So in physics, they talk about refraction, but my kids, they don't talk about refraction. They, they talk about other things. Refraction is basically bending the light. So the cornea is this round structure, and when the light hits it, it bends, right? So the light hits the cornea and bends. Then what happens on its way back to the retina? What structure does it pass through next? It actually doesn't pass through a structure. It passes through a hole in the structure. This is 
little donut shaped thing in our eyes. The iris, yeah. The iris, what does the iris do? It has a skull in the middle, right? How many of you guys have been in like a bathroom and you turn on the light while you're looking at yourself in the mirror? Has anyone done that? Your, your pupils, what do they do? Your, your pupils, when you turn on the light, they contract, or they shrink. The, the pupil becomes smaller, right? And when you turn off the light, what happens? They get wider. Why? So a lot more light. Yeah, this is allowing more or less light in. In photography, the iris, right, it also we can talk about the aperture, how big or small we're leaving the aperture open to allow more light in or less light in. So when we go outside on a bright day, after being inside, our pupils constrict because we're not used to having that much light, right? There's an interesting thing that you can do with pupils. So if someone likes someone else and they come into contact with that person, usually their pupils dilate just a little bit. So if you like someone here and you want to see if they like you too, you can go up to them and say, hi, and look really closely at their eyes and see if they dilate a little bit. If they dilate a little bit, this is a good sign possibly. Although, potentially not, because this can also happen if they really, really hate you. <laughs> but I'm assuming the students here are fairly nice. You, you know, you can use this to figure out if someone likes you. Okay, so the light hits the cornea, it bends a little bit, then it goes through the pupil. If the pupil is small, less of that light is going through. Then what does it go through? Lens. Not the macula. Lens. Through the lens. And what does the lens do? It changes the angle, it bends the light more. So we have two things in our eye that bend the light. The first one is the cornea, and the second one is the lens, right? And some of us actually have three things that bend light. I have a third thing that bends light, <laughs> right? Some people, they don't wear glasses, they wear contacts. And some people, they even have surgery, right? What, what do they have the surgery for? Fix the lens. To fix, not the lens, but it reshapes the cornea to bend light more or less. Okay, so the light it hits the cornea, it bends a little bit, it passes through the pupil, which allows more light, more or less light in, depending on how dark the environment is. And then it hits the lens and it bends even more. And then it passes through this liquidy stuff, eyeball juice, which is technically referred to as the aqueous humor. And then finally, it hits the retina, right? Now there's a particular part of the retina that I wanted you guys to learn about called the fovea. What's the fovea? The, in the study guide, it was discussed when they were talking about the macula. Yeah. So what's the macula? What's the fovea? There's a slight difference, but I'm not going to make the distinction here. It's a special part of your eye where there is an extra high concentration of photoreceptors. And because we have an extra high concentration of photoreceptors in there, we're able to have very fine detailed vision. If you want to see what someone is holding, what do you do? You look directly at it. If I want to see Belize, I look at her face. I don't look over there, right? I can still see her shape and stuff, but I can't see a lot of detail. So if I want to see the details, I need to move my phobias. So they're looking right at it. So when you look at something, the part of the image that you're looking at directly falls into your phobias, allowing you to have better vision. Okay, so on the way back to the retina, the image gets flipped. So the light, it comes in, it bends, bends, it gets flipped upside down, and it gets twisted backwards. So here, we have, uh, in, in real space, it's on the left side of the real space, but it's on the right side of the retina. So this is also interesting, because we have an illusion as far as what the image on our retina is. I don't see you guys as upside down. I see you guys as right side up. 
which means our brain is doing some calculations to flip the image in our head so that way everything is consistent with gravity. All right, some common problems with vision. There's color blindness. Now, trichromatic theory says that we need three different types of cones in order to perceive colors. There are three different types of color receptors, right? So, what could cause color blindness according to trichromatic theory? Light, color, Huh? Uh, the, uh, because of the lack of light color deficiency? Uh, so there is, a, there is a deficiency and it's related to color. It's usually one of the photoreceptors isn't working. So we might have a working short receptor and a working long receptor, but not a working medium one. And because we don't have a working medium one, we're not able to perceive all the colors. You can uh, see what this might be like by adjusting pictures on your computer and removing all of the green information. In Photoshop, you can like get rid of certain colors, right? Take out the red, take out the blue, take out the green. You can take out these colors to see what it would be like, sort of, to be missing one of the receptors. So with color blindness, you're missing one or more of the um, types of photoreceptors. Cataracts, what are cataracts? There's this white, this cloudy white thing, and what does it affect? Does it affect the cornea, the pupil, the lens, the what? Cornea. Not the cornea. The lens. It affects the lens. The lens gets cloudy. So with cataracts, you have a cloudy lens, and this blocks the light. It makes it harder for you to see. People will often have surgery to get rid of this. Glaucoma, sorry, I gave you the answer right here. This is when the pressure of the fluid inside your eye is too high. And over a long period of time, this can actually damage the retina and damage the, act, the optic nerve, which carries the signals from the retina back to your brain. So in order to uh, treat glaucoma, people use medicine and often surgery. One of the more popular ways at least from the patient's perspective in the states, in California and a few other states, is to use medical marijuana. So people, they smoke marijuana, and this decreases the pressure in their eyes. You know, I don't know why this is such a popular treatment, but it is. All right, glasses, contacts, and lasers. So with myopia, we have nearsightedness. This means that you can see things that are close to you, but you can't see things that are far away. And the reason for this is that the eye is relative to the, the roundness of the lens and the cornea. The eye is too long, right? So you can't see far. The light gets bent too much for the far objects. The close-up objects, you need to bend that light quite a bit. But the ones that are farther away, you don't need to bend as much because they're projecting much straighter uh, vectors anyway. With hyperopia, you have the opposite problem. So with hyperopia, you can see things that are far, but you can't see things that are near. And this is because the eye is relatively too short. So in treating this, like, it's difficult to make the eye longer or shorter, right? But it's really easy to add a lens that allows you to bend the light more or less, or to change the shape of your uh, cornea. Some more illusions, the blind spot. Did you guys do this demonstration on the study guide? So it's really cool. If you do it correctly, then the hole in the line, it, it just disappears. It, what happens? It's not that there's this blank, empty space. It actually looks like the line is completely continuous. This is an illusion, right? Because there actually is a gap there but the brain fills in the space based on the other things that are around it. But when you are looking out in the world, even if you do it with one eye, it, it might not work for you right now because it depends on how close you are. We could have everyone like come closer and farther away, but that would take too much time. You can do this study guide on the, the web. Anyway, um, if you close one eye, like you're not aware that there's a blind spot. It's not like, oh, there's nothing over there. Because your brain fills the information in with stuff that's around it. Okay, culture and perception. 
not everyone sees the same thing. This is, I think, a really sort of cute story. So what's the deal with the booty um, pygmies? What happened? So this anthropologist went out with them, right? And these people, they normally live in dense tropical forests. So they're usually only seeing things that are fairly close to them. Because after about 20 feet, all of the, the trees and the bushes and the shrubs have blocked your vision, right? So you're only used to seeing things up close. So the anthropologist took him out, or took the, the people out, where there was wide open spaces, right? And the people, they saw buffaloes from far away. Have any of you guys been on a really tall building and looked down? And it's like, oh, the cars, they look like toys. So the same thing happened with the pygmies. So they saw these buffaloes that were really far away, and what did they think that they were? Insects. Yeah, they're like, what are those insects over there? I've never seen insects like that before. And the anthropologist is like, dude, are you serious? Insects? That's a buffalo. Buffalo? No, I've seen buffalo. Buffalo are huge, right? Those things are tiny. So what happened? They, they drove closer. <laughs> These little insects began to grow. And we don't perceive these things as growing when we get closer to them. I don't see Sunday, oh man, he's becoming a giant now. Oh, he's getting so tiny. Because I'm used to seeing things this way. But the people who weren't used to seeing things this way, and who aren't used to extracting information about distance to make conclusions about how big something really is, they per per uh, perceive these big buffalo as insects. What's the carpenter world hypothesis? Carpenters, what do they make? They make doors, they make windows, they make furniture, they make tables, they make houses. And carpenters, they often use right angles, right? They have this nice right angle at the edge of our doors and our windows and our desks and things. And these right angles don't appear a lot in nature, right? And there are some illusions that we have that are thought to be somewhat related to the right angles and the, the parallel lines that our carpenters have created for us. So this is known as a Ponzo illusion. Which line appears to be longer? The top one should appear to be longer to you if you're experiencing the Ponzo illusion. But they're actually the exact same length. So it's the same thing. Interestingly, you might actually experience another illusion here. Did any of you seem to feel like it got smaller here and then leveled out? Did you guys see that? Let me do it again. Does it seem to get smaller as it gets closer? So maybe I'm doing some computer trickery to fool you guys. So let's get rid of the pictures. Is it clear now that they're the same length? So because we have these parallel lines converging, we know that parallel lines converge at a distance, right? Because we've had a lot of experience with parallel lines in our carpenter worlds. So when we see something that in relationship to the parallel lines is much bigger, right? If we say, aha, you know, this is farther away, and since it's the same size on our retina, the only way it could be farther away and the same size on our retina is if it's actually bigger in the real world. So we have this illusion. We perceive that as being bigger. There's another illusion related to this, the Mueller-Lyer illusion. So which of these lines looks longer? They look the same? <laughs> The second one. This one? Why? Well, if you think about where you observe corners like that, if you're in this room looking towards that corner, you see something that's very similar to this, right? And in this situation, that line is the farthest thing from you. If instead you see something like this, this is like the corner of a building. When you're outside, aha. And now that line is the closest thing to you. So if you use these sort of relative distance coordinates, and this one is the farthest thing from you, and that's the closest thing to you, 
If they're both the same size on your retina, the only way that this one could be, you know, the same size if it's farther, if we perceive it as being farther, is if it's actually larger. But it's actually it is larger. It's actually not larger. If you download the slides, you can get a, a ruler and you can verify that these are the same length. Okay, so there's um, this other illusion, or the, I'm sorry, the Mueller Lyre illusion is actually culturally dependent. So what do you guys see in this situ in this scene right here? There are people, where are they? They're in a room, right? Here's the, the edge of the wall, here's the ceiling coming down, it's very much like that, right? Here there's a, a window, but if you show this to people who haven't been in a very carpentered world, and they're used to living in round huts where there aren't these corners, what do they see? They see something very different. Instead of seeing these people in a room, they see these people sitting underneath a tree. Here's the tree. And they don't see a window here, they see a woman with something on her head. Which suggests that our culture plays a large role in how we perceive the things that we see. It's the same physical stimulus for you, me, and everyone else. But based on the information I have about how I grew up and where I grew up, I perceive something very different than someone who is quite different from me. Which is really sort of neat. Our next practice, we're going to talk about hearing, how our ears help us to hear, and uh, again, some cultural influences on hearing.